the topic is runic magic, the real one, and um, by real one I mean here this historical one. Um, this is a topic which has been an extremely sensitive one throughout um, the past, let's say, 200, particularly the past 100 years, because it has been um, overused and misused, misappropriated in all kinds of forms, uh, in especially with regard to the political misappropriation. So that's why I think uh, it is important to have a uh, discussion um, about it. I'm actually a, a historian, not a linguist, but I do need these inscriptions because I'm dealing with the Viking Age and um, they are among the very few inscriptions actually stemming from uh, the time period and space uh, I am studying. So it's also very important um, for me. So what we'll be discussing today, um, I am going to show you a couple of uh, inscriptions dealing with enabling magic and healing magic from not only from the time of the Vikings, but also from earlier on from the so-called Merovingian period. And I will also show you a couple of, uh, of medieval ones so that we can see that we are dealing actually with a very broad um, time span here. So, like I said before, there have been a great, there has been a great deal of misconceptions about this particular uh, topic, and most information you are going to find on the internet today uh, is to be taken with a great deal of caution, because generally speaking, you're going to find a lot of people claiming that they can perform runic divination, although we have no idea how that was performed, uh, as a matter of fact, and you're also going to find a lot of lists with runes and uh, a couple of concepts um, or symbols associated to them, which again, it is, um, is extremely problematic uh, due to the uh, lack of sources. So when we say runes, we actually mean a couple of things because there have been multiple alphabetic systems known as the Futharks. First of all, we are dealing with the Elder Futhark. This is, uh, let's say, the more general uh, Germanic alphabet used to transcribe a lot of Germanic languages uh, from um, Gothic Old High German to Proto uh, Norse and several Germanic dialects, and it has been in use in use uh, till about seven seven eight hundred with a transitional period, and this transitional period leads us to the younger Futhark. This is the actual um, Viking alphabet, if you want to call it uh, like that. So the alphabet used in the Viking Age, but also beyond the Viking Age, so um, from eight hundred to about uh, twelve hundred uh, A.D. Otherwise, we also have the Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Frisian Futhark, as well as medieval runes, uh, which have taken inspiration from the more, uh, from the older runes, but um, uh, with a couple of uh, changes, such as more bind runes and uh, decorative um, symbols, and so on and so forth. So, among the first objects, I say among the first objects because you never know what um, is going to be discovered in the meantime. Uh, we have the uh, Vimosicom. This is apparently so far the oldest inscription we uh, we know in the Elder Futhark, it uh, is dated back to about uh, 160 and it carries uh, an inscription with um, uh, the term Harya, which um, most likely has some kind of militaristic uh, meaning in the sense of warrior. Uh, such terms are found actually on uh, multiple inscriptions uh, from later periods as well. And uh, it is an exciting field because in the past months, for example, um, we have at least two vital uh, discoveries. Uh, the first of one, first of all, being um, the one in uh, Denmark, we have a bracteate, so a small um, coin-like pendant where we have the name of the god Odin for the first time. Um, and uh, the inscription states something like, I belong to Odin or something of the sort and um, uh, then we also have um, what uh, we now deem as the oldest um, runestone that was discovered in Norway and it dates back to about uh, 200 uh, AD. So whenever we discuss about um, dates, dating, we also need to take into account that um, discoveries are made um, in the passage of time and we have to uh, adapt to them. So the runes are also grouped in series called the Athir, as you can see here, both um, in the Elder Futhark and yeah, more visible in, uh, in the Younger Futhark. I also need to mention that um, in terms of deciphering the inscriptions, the Elder Futhark is actually a little easier and that is because it has more letters, it has 24 letters and they are more or less 
um, identical or at least similar to uh, to the Latin alphabet. The Younger Fourth Arc has been um, simplified, severely simplified. We're only left with 16 letters, and the problem is that uh, one letter can be used to represent um, more sounds, which creates a little bit of a problem. So you also need knowledge of historical linguistics in order to uh, decipher the uh, the inscriptions. But then again, that's also something extremely, uh, extremely fascinating, at least um, uh, to my mind. They also have names, um, actually reconstructed names. We have a couple of sources called the runic poems, um, the uh, Anglo-Saxon runic poem, the Norwegian runic poem, and the Icelandic runic poem, which is the most complete one, but unfortunately is it is of later date. It dates back to the 15th uh, century. And based on the names for these runes inscribed in these poems, and by the way, they tend to have had a mnemonic function, uh, simply due to the fact that people might have forgotten what they were actually called. So in the 15th century, yeah, probably they would have. So these poems were used to like remember uh, the ancient times and uh, ancient law and so on, and uh, also draw a connection to uh, to the past. But anyway, based on these poems, uh, the old oldest of them being the Anglo-Saxon one, as a matter of fact, based on them, we could reconstruct uh, the proto-Germanic terms used to designate these runes. And as you can see, so you have every uh, every rune standing for a concept as well. So, for example, the first rune, Fehu, um, stands for uh, cattle or wealth. This is, however, not to say that if, for example, I wrote the rune F on some stone or some stick, that automatically meant that I was invoking wealth to come to me. Uh, it didn't really work like that. So, runes were first and foremost a uh, an alphabetic system, but they do sometimes occur in magical inscriptions, as we shall see, but not in the sense that the runes themselves possess some magical powers, but rather the way you use them and mix them up, uh, combine them, uh, that would have also had some kind of uh, symbolic meaning and um, uh, also magical meaning, incantation, enabling uh, spells as well as healing spells, fertility charms, uh, even love spells and so on and so forth. With regard to rune stones, um, this is also a very interesting topic. Um, I just wanted to say this is not the topic for today, but we're going to uh, be dealing with uh, with them anyway when uh, discussing runes. Um, so most rune stones, which actually stem from the Viking Age, not earlier. Uh, these are rather the exceptions. What you can see here, uh, the Berketor, Persten, Toften, and Rök rune stone. Uh, they're from the transitional period, more or less. Um, most rune stones do seem to have a commemorative function so it's essentially a member of the kin uh, erecting this monument in honor of another member of um, uh, of the kin who probably died um, somewhere or anyway very generally as a form of uh, honoring them uh, they are also used to set disputes with regard to inheritance and property and they can also be uh, used when you erect for example an important uh, administrative um, building or you know some 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 kind of important landmark such as a bridge if you did that you wanted to show to everyone else that you were this member of important member of the elite and you had the opportunity and the power to uh, erect such uh, such a monument so these are monuments that would have uh, would have st uh, stood out in the middle of the landscape they would have been very visible so in this way you would have shown the entire community um, how important you were uh, essentially so it it's kind of like um, the equivalent of a funerary stone because most of them uh, actually date um, uh, to the period of conversion uh, or Christianization, so not uh, not earlier. However, you do have some very interesting exceptions uh, to this um, uh, to this rule. For example, on the Björketop rune stone, you're going to find the uh, carver who designates himself as himself as the master of runes, and he says that he concealed here the runes of power and may the one who breaks the monument be uh, doomed to insidious death and plagued by effeminacy, which uh, was a pretty serious curse uh, to cast upon someone at, um, uh, at the time. 
Um, also an interesting example we have here in the Stentoft uh, uh, runestone. Uh, here you have, again, a master of, uh, of the rune and um, it's also very cryptical because it mentions some dwellers and some guests uh, to whom a guy named Hadulfar gave full year and it is also stated that Hari Ulvar concealed here nine stallions, nine bucks uh, and uh, the runes of power and again the classical curse made the one who breaks the monument uh, be doomed. So this is most likely in relation to some kind of ritual, some kind of offering uh, due to the um, uh, animals mentioned here as well as uh, to the uh, harvest uh, which we have on the runestone and probably one of the most complex runestones both from the Merovingian and from the Viking Age is the Rök runestone it is extremely cryptic um, a lot of interpretations or several interpretations have been proposed um, it seems lately that um, um, the idea of it containing riddles with reference to some mythological content from the time of the uh, migration seems to be the most likely interpretation here so it it starts like in the usual way with um, uh, the runestone being erected in memory of someone called Vormother, um, and then it's, it is stated who uh, who coloured, who carved the runes, and that the father erected this monument uh, in the memory of his dead son, but the problems arrive uh, afterwards because then some kind of folk tale is, um, um, is told here with two war booties, uh, 12 times taken as war booty together with various men, and then a series of riddles regarding some probably gothic lost mythological uh, content which um, uh, yeah they're like i said very difficult to uh, decipher but these are narrative uh, rune stones so you basically tell uh, tell a story not necessarily something magical is um, being invoked here and that is why i'm going to uh, move on uh, speaking of magic, yes, you can use rune in an alphabetic way. This is the most common way to uh, use them. So you basically write spells with the runes as a means of communication. And as a means of communication, you can write both uh, profane and magical or religious things. But then you have the more seldom use of them ideographically. Uh, the uh, term in German scholarship for that is Begriffsrunen, Begriff meaning concept. So essentially with the rune, um, designating a concept but i repeat this this is not really a, a common usage so in the previous inscription from the stent of runestone uh, we do have an example uh, for this so when it is stated um, that Hath um, ulfar gave full year the rune is not really the rune signifying harvest or good year because year usually meant good harvest uh, it is not the word it is not written in fully it is just the rune written on uh, on the rune stone so in in this sense yeah you could use a rune to symbolize a, a concept but then again that's not really frequently done um also, you have the mother rune from the Viking Age, meaning uh, man or person. More generally, that is also pretty common to use uh, ideographically. Uh, but then again, most runes are just used uh, in, uh, in writing, so to write all kinds of charms and, um, uh, and spells. And speaking of which, we can group them in um, uh, according to their functions. So you can have a function of just invoking the gods to a certain purpose. You can have a function of uh, enabling an object to gain power, or you can have a function of uh, healing some someone from a disease, uh, as we shall see later on, as well as um, other types of functions such as fertility charms or even uh, even love spells. With regard to the usage of the runes, we have a couple of clues. Um, there has been a lot of debate regarding the divination function of the runes. Uh, I must say we don't really know that much about it. Um, we do have a reference in uh, the um, uh, Germania written by uh, Tacitus, but that is really an old reference and we don't know how much uh, it extended over the following thousand years. So in Germania, in chapter 10, he does mention uh, the divination using what he calls notai, 
yeah, it's it's maybe a a proto form of runes or something like that carved on uh, on sticks, but we don't really have any details about how this was uh, was actually done. We do have references references with regard to the importance of the runes and their magical nature in uh, later texts. Um, by magical nature, I rather mean here the idea that they were extremely important to convey uh, a message. We have the Runatal, for example, that is a part of the poem Hovamol uh, in the Poetic Edda, where we have the idea of uh, Odin, God Odin, sacrificing himself to himself in order to gain uh, knowledge of the runes. So it would have definitely been a very important thing to be able to write uh, at the time. And um, um, at least at the beginning, only the elites would have been able to do so. Um, so, of course, they would have also gained this connotation of being something kind of uh, fantastic and, and supernatural. And then again, we have the Sigurd Trivumol, which is also a poem from the Poetic Edda, written in the 1200s. And here again, we have uh, a little more complex um, retelling of the usages of the runes, but then again in a very cryptic manner. Um, this is about uh, a Valkyria called Sigurd Riva, uh, Brynhildr in the Volsunga saga, who essentially teaches uh, the hero Sigurd how to use runes. And she uses a lot of terms to designate them, for example, uh, victory runes or protection runes, even ale runes, all runar, very interestingly, but we don't re we're not really sure about what, what exactly these runes uh, these runes meant. So from the, from the context and from, from the general context of the corpus of the runes, we can dwell on this idea that um, they would have been regarded as a very powerful means of communication and um, uh, thus they would have had this function to, uh, to fill someone or uh, something with, um, uh, with magical powers by inscribing, uh, inscribing runes, um, to um, uh, inscribing a message written in runes either on stone or on either kind of object. Um, then again, we also have later references in some sagas. For example, in the saga of Egil, there is a very interesting episode episode where uh, the, the hero Egil Skatla Grimson, he erects uh, what is known as a Nidstung, uh, which is uh, a pillar of infamy, essentially. Um, it is directed to uh, Eric Bloodaxe, with whom he has a feud, and uh, with, um, uh, with his wife, with his queen Gunhild as well. And he erects this pole with, um, with, the head of the um, with the head of a dead horse on it. And he also scribbles the pole with all kinds of runes. And um, he says that these runes are going to attract a curse um, upon the king. And you also have a couple of references in um, the legendary saga of Bossi and Herauth, as well as some <clears throat> references about using uh, runes in order to um, in order to cause evil to someone in the saga of Grettir, but no further details are added here. So the, the exact runes that are used or uh, the message sent, that's, that's not something we know a lot about, unfortunately. So if you see on the internet lists like this one here, with Viking rune meanings, please be very, very cautious because there is a lot of mixing up of concepts which have nothing to do with one another. Um, also concepts that are not to be found, not even in the rune poems where, where we actually find the name uh, the name of the runes. Uh, and the runes of the elder Futhark also tend to be mixed up with um, uh, the runes of the younger Futhark. And um, again, about divination, yeah, sure, you can try to do that, but remember that whatever you do, uh, it's based on a very, very modern uh, interpretation inspired by all kinds of movements in the uh, uh, neo-heathen, neo-pagan scene, new age scene, and so, and so on and so forth. And it has very uh, little historical uh, relevance. Okay, so speaking of historical relevance, let's um, look at a couple of inscriptions. So the most obvious way of calling on the divine to fill an object with magical powers would have been to just inscribe a message requesting the gods to, uh, to do so. And this you can see on this um, buckle on this part of a saddle strap found at the site known as Vimusa, which literally means the holy bog. This would be in uh, in Denmark. And uh, the meaning here is end ring to the ors I dedicate. Ors being the singular 
of Asir, uh, the main group of, um, of gods. It's a very old inscription from the third century. Um, there has been some controversy in the past concerning the reading of the inscription. This is something that happens all the time uh, because of the double A rune spelling, um, a strategy which might have been used to highlight uh, a word much like we do with capital uh, letters today. Uh, it does seem to be similar to a line of, uh, of poetry and both religious and magical sayings are often used like that in a magical form. And um, we can also assume that they would have also been sung, not only, uh, not only spoken. So here you have just uh, a way to invoke the, the divine for, uh, for help and the end ring could have been um, very well a logical metaphor, a way of describing a, uh, a buckle, probably a poetic one. Examples of the kind abound. Sometimes we have the luck um, of finding inscriptions with um, uh, the very names of a couple of gods that would have been common at the time. We have the Nordentorf fibula, for example, the safety pin from the 6th century. Um, and uh, these safety pin brooches were quite common in the early medieval times and uh, favored by uh, most Germanic uh, peoples, uh, regardless, regardless of the um, uh, of the gender. Um, and uh, here we have three names. We have Logathore Vodan and Wigi Thonar. So, um, it's very interesting because, of course, we identify we can identify here the older uh, continental Germanic name of Odin, so uh, Wodan, and we also can find uh, Thor here, Thor um, uh, bringing the victory, the vic victory bringer, if you want. And um, the problem here would be with um, uh, Logathor. This is. A little difficult to interpret, and but this would seem to be the old Germanic counterpart of Lodur. And this is a figure quoted a couple of times as a friend of Odin by um, uh, an Icelandic skald accompanying Odin in a scene in the Norse mythological poem, the Voluspo, the Cirrus's prophecy, where, um, yeah, you have a triad of uh, deities. Uh, this would have been a, a common theme at the time uh, as well. And um, uh, Logathore, which would have meant a trickster or a sorcerer, um, would it would have made sense for Loki to be called uh, like that as well. And uh, with uh, regard to the second part, uh, sorry, to the last line of the inscription, this is a little, uh, a little difficult to uh, to interpret. It seems to have to do with the two names here. Um, Awa seems to be a woman's pet uh, name, and um, uh, Leuvini. It's it would mean something like love, uh, love friend. So what exactly is um, uh, meant here is a little bit uh, cryptic. However, um, we can assume that it would have been an attempt to maybe wish uh, wish a couple uh, good luck. I am um, I'm thinking it could have been uh, been this um, right. Yeah. Okay. Here we have an inscription found near Vierlöse, so in Denmark, with something which is really, really common to see in this inscription, in these inscriptions, which is the term uh, "alu" in combination with all kinds of uh, words, uh, usually designated designated divine beings, such as we have here "alu god." Um, right. So, so you can find this kind of uh, dedication when you want to ask for luck from a particular uh, deity. So you're going to find in other sources, for example, on the Fortson uh, buckle, be lucky Allah win, be lucky Allah win and Allah with. So a reference to some mythological beings and the use of the prefix, prefix Al, which is uh, great or whole. Um, and um, you were going to find this prefix quite often also in the names, for example, of Germanic mother goddesses attested in the Rhineland in Roman times, who do have epithets of, uh, of, similar, of similar forms, as well as in the better known uh, epithet of Odin as the Alfather. So the, yeah, I would, I would call him the, the great father, although 
the um, second term. Uh, father is um, um, also a bit controversial regarding uh, what it could have um, could have meant. You can see here that this is used in the vocative uh, case. It was found in the grave of a woman who died in her early uh, 30s or, or 20s. Um, and uh, it is also followed by a swastika. The swastika was a divine symbol in both Germanic and Celtic tradition, generally speaking in Central Europe, uh, in um, uh, the Bronze Age and in the uh, Iron Age. And um, yeah, as you know, unfortunately, it was ruined by National Socialism, but um, you're going to find it very often on a lot of objects this period. It's a solar uh, symbol. It's a solar symbol of Indo-European origin, as a matter of fact, and it is one of the most common symbols you're ever going to uh, to find. So, like I said, this is a very common inscription. The great god, so the great god would have made this brooch appear blessed or lucky. In uh, Setra in Norway, we have the example of a rune inscribed kiln, which has been found along some other items, and um, um, the goods date to the 6th, 7th century AD. Um, and we, here we have a reading with um, hail made of maids, dedication to Nana, dedication to Nana. Contextually speaking, I think the term dedication as a translation for Alu would uh, seem at least now uh, the most um, uh, appropriate. The, this inscription, the transcription given here is the most commonly accepted one. Um, and uh, Nana is also the name of a goddess uh, that appears in later sources, the wife of the god um, Baldr, and it seems to be uh, Part of a prayer, perhaps, and the expression made of maids is also known from the older, uh, sorry, later Norse uh, sources. Um, the term alo employed here appears quite commonly in early runic amulet legends and uh, belongs to a special category of words that are very, very typical for this uh, kind of Germanic amulet, but uh, which only rarely appear as part of full sentences. Functionally, they seem to have been uh, the Germanic counterparts of the vocus magicae of Gnostic amulets, but unlike the charm words of the classical tradition, they are not divine or, uh, or sacred um, names. More recently, Alu has been shown to appear in North Etruscan votive, uh, votive use, where the term clearly means uh, dedication. So given the fact that um, the later latest theories regarding the origins of the runes tend to place them somewhere uh, at the uh, confluence of the Germanic space and the Celtic space, and they would have probably been uh, influenced by Alpine alphabets such as Lepontic. Um, so in, in Cisalpine Gaul, this interpretation is actually uh, a, an acceptable one, the fact that they would have had all these contacts with um, other populations in the area and they would have adopted some uh, vital uh, markers uh, of communication and um, uh, signifiers. So these were short ones and we also have longer ones and uh, this is probably one of the most interesting objects you're going to find uh, that has runes inscribed on it. Uh, this is a human skull, a part of a human skull found at uh, Ribe, which was a very important uh, Viking settlement in Denmark. And um, it is generally assumed that um, um, the skull piece taken from the top of the cranium was not that of a recently killed victim uh, decapitated for that uh, for that purpose but um, um, rather it had been exposed for some times before the runes were uh, were engraved on it it also doesn't seem to have anything to do with the practice of uh, of trepanation the text is a transitional inscription which predates the viking period so 8th century let's say at the border of the viking age and um, probably executed around the uh, 7 uh, 725 it has a mixture of runes stemming from both the elder and the younger futhark and it reads that Ulv and Odin and Hai Tyr is 
help for boar against these pain and stroke of a dwarf boar carved. So this is a healing spell. This seems to be a healing spell, at least. We have a triad of of gods, although we, we're not really sure what uh, is meant by Ulver here, which literally means uh, wolf. But anyway, Odin does have a connotation of, uh, of healer. This is something something you're going to find, for example, in the sayings of the High One, so in the Hovamol, in the Poetic Edda, um, where it is said that he does know spells which the sons of men uh, need. And the role of the dwarf as an agent of disease is also well attested in the Germanic folklore, although we don't really have a, a clear idea of what this, uh, this stroke was, um, against which uh, this uh, inscription was supposedly uh, meant to, uh, to ward. So Ulva may be a poetic reference to another divinity, uh, or perhaps even to Odin himself, because Odin is also connected to, to wolves. He has two wolves, Gedi and Ferki, living at, um, uh, at his court. And um, uh, the second name, Hai Tyr, might also have two meanings. It either means Tyr, like the warrior god from uh, Old Norse mythology, but the earlier meaning was actually a god in in general because Tyr is actually cognate with uh, Deus from uh, from Latin. So it's not really certain what it was meant uh, what it was meant here. Uh, compare for this uh, Sik Tyr, which means victory god, or Fimbul Tyr, the mighty god. It's it's really a very very common term you're going to find uh, everywhere in Old Norse uh, poetry. Then we have another inscription, this time referring to the exploits to the most popular Norse god, which is Thor, found on a small copper plate from uh, Kvinneby on the Swedish island of Öland. Uh, it's from the 11th century. It is uh, just a square measuring around five uh, square centimeters covered with several lines of runic texts winding backward and forward along with the rough outline of a, of a fish. Um, and the inscription actually does refer to a uh, myth featuring uh, Thor, which suggests that we are dealing with a narrative uh, charm. So it goes like this. I call for you, help Bovi, help me. Um, knowledge or something of the sort, Ehud, this is a term we really don't know what it is, but from the context, maybe knowledge um, is certain for you. And may the lightning hold all evil away from Bovi. May Thor protect him with that hammer which came out from the sea. Flee from evil, it will get nothing from Bovi and the gods are under him and over him. So more or less, this would be the uh, inscription. As you can see, we are dealing with um, a poetic text. Um, we are also dealing with um, common common features of poetic texts such as alliteration and assonance um, although we don't really have a full uh, we don't really have a standard norse meter it seems there seems to be some allusion to the tale of thor's fishing expedition uh, this is related in the uh, poem from the poetic edda known as the poem of himir where thor sailed out with the giant to fish the monstrous midgars um, using the head of an ox as a bait and when he finally managed to hook the evil serpent, he was uh, struck at his head with his uh, uh, hammer and it sank back into the uh, sea. We also have an alternate version of this in Snorri's um, prose edda. So what seems to be going on here is that the carver of the amulet uh, is definitely appealing to God Thor for protection, for security, presumably at sea from the overall uh, context, because, you know, at sea, um, a sudden storm would have been a great danger. And without some protective deity hovering um, above you, you would have yeah, you would have had um, um, lesser chances to uh, to survive. And several spells against drowning are also known from uh, Scandinavian spell books from a much later uh, date. And um, magical runes to ensure safety at sea are also mentioned in uh, the poem I had before, uh, the Sigurd Drivu Mål. 
So yeah, Thunder God Thor, very popular during the Viking Age, and it is worth remembering that he is also the pagan god invoked on rune stones from Scandinavia. No other god is invoked on rune stones from uh, Scandinavia. So this is also worth remembering. Um, we also have later references. We have later references, for example, from this stick found in Bergen in the 12th century. Uh, here we have a reference to the two main Norse gods, to Thor and Odin. Uh, this is found on, um, um, this was found in the 12th century, so in 1185, um, uh, dated back to 1185. And um, actually a lot of similar objects were found in, uh, in Bergen, but most inscription seems to be very profane. Um, they don't have anything ritualistic or uh, magical uh, around them. However, sometimes we do find an invocation of uh, pagan deities, which may come as a surprise because the date is uh, very late for such a thing. Uh, however, we must also remember that despite the conversion of Norway to Christianity, essentially achieved by the two uh, Olafs, Olaf Tryggvason and Saint Olaf. Um, we uh, also find a great mix of pagan and Christian uh, elements up until a later, uh, a later date. The stick, however, may, not, may have no supernatural function at all, but simply represents uh, the recording of a literary tradition. This is also something we need to, uh, to take into account, that these objects don't necessarily always represent a, a blessing. Sometimes um, they're just uh, poetic texts uh, written on all kinds of uh, kinds of objects. Uh, but either way, the reference is very interesting because it essentially says, hail to you and may you be in good spirits. May Thor receive you and may Odin own you. This is interesting because this expression, Odin, may Odin own you. So this idea of Odin, o Odin having ownership, um, ownership on you, this is something you're also going to find in a couple of sagas. Um, the ownership of his fallen warriors of the Einhediar is referred here most probably and this is made very clearly in uh, in a prose tale of Styrbjorn uh, in the Icelandic collection known as the Flatria book and this tale records that um, in a battle in the middle of the 10th century the Swedish king Eiriker after sacrificing to Odin cast a stick over the opposing army while making a battle cry and this battle cry was precisely this Odin owns all of you. So you're going to be sacrificed to uh, to Odin. So from this point of view, perhaps this inscription can be interpreted as a funerary charm, appealing to the gods to receive uh, to receive the corpse. Although the opening line of wishing good health, good spirits, doesn't seem to uh, to be in harmony with the, uh, with the former idea, um, it may also represent a pagan greeting because a similar uh, formulae can be found in some old Germanic uh, texts, including um, a reference in the poem of uh, Himir, uh, where it is also said, hail to you, Himir, in such good spirits. Or then, but then again, it may be a combination uh, of, um, of the two of them. So these were a couple of examples where you can find um, the names of the gods asking to do something in particular. And then we have a very large category of spells known as enabling spells. So these are essentially spells that are written in runes on particular objects in order to make them more uh, more powerful. And we have this reference again in Sigrid um, again with the formulae uh, Sigrunar or Valrunar, like the battle runes mentioned several times, not only in this poem, but also in some old English literary uh, sources, although I repeat, we, we're not really sure what what they were or which runes were exactly meant here or whether the whole alphabet was, uh, was meant here. My suspicion would be that the whole alphabet was meant here. Uh, in the old in the old English poem Solomon and Satan, for example, uh, we are told that uh, bookstaves bewitch the blade in sword fame. So uh, if you inscribed some runes on your sword, you would have probably made it more powerful. Uh, at some point in uh, the Eddic poem uh, For Skirnis or Skirnis Journey, uh, a sword is described as being adorned with 
council and um, this could have also meant the idea of writing uh, something uh, on it. For example, we have this short sword found over a century ago in the River Thames and it is now in the British uh, Museum. Um, and uh, the inscription, so in the inscription you can see here actually uh, the alphabet, so simply the, the alphabet um, written down, which would have been uh, also meaningful uh, as a potential charm. And you can also find um, uh, find an, a name here. So the name actually Begnoth is the only part of the text that is in linguistically uh, meaningful. Um, and um, um, as in, in other charms and um, amateur uh, finds, the runic equivalent to an ABC, so an alphabet, can have a magical function and uh, an effect on the blade. Otherwise, it wouldn't appear on so, so many objects. So simply writing the alphabet on an object would have endowed it with powers. Right, another example of a similar text was found in a place called Lindholm in uh, Denmark in the 5th century. Dating back to the 5th century, it is a piece of bone um, which was worked more or less into this uh, crescent shape um, fish perhaps or serpent and it uh, is definitely an, uh, an amulet uh, and it reads i am called um i am called the the sun or um i i am the carver i the carver am called the sun um erilas this is something which would seem to mean uh earl like a lord of some kind but then again, it could also be something uh, more general, a more general designation for the one carving the runes, um, actually uh, stating his power in carving these, um, uh, these runes. And then you can see something which is yeah, not really intelligible um, with the alu at the end, again, the dedication. So we can speculate that this was probably also a lucky charm, or perhaps it had something to do with um, uh, with fishing or sailing, giving the uh, shape of the uh, of the object. In a small village in Hungary called Pesenia, uh, we also have some interesting finds here. A couple of um, runic inscriptions, probably of Lombard manufacture, uh, because the Lombards were still living on the Pannonian uh, plains at the time, so in the 6th century. Uh, so on these uh, long silver bow brooches, you are just going to find some, a couple of names, laconic texts, so amulets, wishing their owners, both uh, women, Lombard women, joy and uh, blessing. So it, we do have some kind of formula here, if you will, um, a name plus a special or a magical word. And by using this, um, yeah, you could actually empower that object to uh, allow you to bestow upon you the um, qualities or the blessings you, uh, you desired. Um, such texts seem to be paralleled by further ones. Um, this time, uh, two of the basic elements seem to have been linked and expanded into a more eloquent manner. Uh, it's also a longer inscription and it seems to have to do something with protection as well. Uh, it mentions protection on a wood uh, plane that is a wooden weapon sharpener that was again found in Vimosa. It's a, it's a very rich uh, place, archaeologically speaking, uh, dating very early uh, back to the third century, so about 200. Uh, the runes, unfortunately, are not really that legible, but um, it has been transcribed as something like uh, Spearman, you may want offerings, I counsel uh, protection. So despite the difficulty of interpretation, it is reminiscent of a narrative charm as well, possibly a designation for uh, the owner of the wood plane. Um, <clears throat> we um, uh, probably have his nickname written here, although that's not really that, uh, that certain what this first um, um, word was, but at any rate, uh, it may be that the plane is suggesting 
I am giving you uh, protection, so I, I am now an object of power, and I am giving you, the owner, uh, protection or counsel. Similar objects have been found, similar inscriptions have also been found on a couple of spear shafts, uh, dating, again, uh, back to the 5th century, so the migration period, they're old inscriptions, uh, and uh, this is, for example, the Kaohul uh, spear shaft, it was excavated in the 19th century, and it is carved with runes um, decorated much as those on uh, uh, on other amulets I uh, I showed you. So again, we can see this formula of Erila, so either Earl, Mua, perhaps like the, the title mentioned, or um, or like I said before, maybe it is just a designation uh, of the one who carved uh, the stone, the runes, acknowledging the fact that he had the power to to do that. And uh, it is a very poetic inscription because it is state it states that I cry a roar. I invoke hail in the spear, which actually makes a lot of sense because you would have wanted your weapon to be powerful, to be uh, as powerful as to liberate a roar, as well as to cause hail on the uh, on the enemy. So it's a, it's a very poetic expression on, uh, on an item. And um, this is um, a typical charm function, uh, charm function words, uh, much as uh, it was found in Vimosa and um, uh, probably also in other places such as the uh, Spin the Wall at Ström and other Germanic uh, spearheads. Speaking of spearheads, some of them also have uh, have names. So we have here two examples, one from uh, Darmstorff and the other from Kowal. Um, uh, there are also some from Illerup again in uh, in Denmark. So we have here names such as the router or the potentially target rider, although again, uh, so sometimes the interpretation is a little bit uh, speculative. But what we need to remember from this is that this is something you would have done uh, in order to empower your objects. Just um, write the name of your uh, of your spear and then perhaps also uh, decorate it with a couple of um, um, a, a couple of combinations of um, uh, of symbols. Yeah, another example here from. Uh, Nudem in uh, the fifth, uh, um, and it seems to be interpretable linguistically. Um, but if we take into account what we discussed um, um, earlier about uh, how letter sequences in themselves can function as um, magical symbols, um, we can assume that somehow this would have also had uh, the power to enchant the spear uh, some way. So there have been uh, some interesting studies about the way these inscriptions are organized. And I am going to point here, uh, point out a very important uh, book on, uh, on the matter. Uh, the book is called Runic Amulets and Magical Objects, or the other way around, Magical Objects. Uh, anyway, you're going to find it in the, uh, in the description at the end. Uh, at any rate, uh, the book uh, written by McLeod and um, Mies in 2006 um, has an interesting summary regarding the composition of these expressions. And the older formulae seems to ha seem to have been reduced to a couple of um, a couple of essential characteristics. So first of all, we have letter sequences. That means we have the Elder Futhark rows or apparently some kind of encoded assortment of runes. Then we, we would have some naming inscriptions, expressions such as a single name, but um, also more complex ones such as um, I am called this and that, and I say my name, and I say what I've done. Uh, then we have terms called the formula or charm words. These include the alu we discussed earlier. We can also have symbols such as um, tree-like shaped um, tree-like. Uh, they were like um, they look like these three tier runes pushed together the tree symbol. Then we also have Triskelia and uh, uh, Swastika and the uh, Tamgas. The, these are those decorations I showed you on the um, uh, spear shafts. So it's of course not necessary to have all these five characteristics in these inscriptions, but you will have a minimum of 
two on either inscription uh, you find at least from the Merovingian from the um, uh, time of the migration. So check out this book, uh, Runic Amulets and Magical Objects, because it has uh, a lot of supplementary information. And I also um, used it uh, in order to um, prepare the presentation for today. It's really an extraordinary um, work. Um, yeah, so... For example, the Lindholm amulet I showed you earlier can be analyzed as a naming expression plus a, a letter sequence plus a charm um, word and the Nidamshaft text is a letter sequence plus a symbol. Some are much more difficult to retrieve because they seem to be pretty much encoded, such as the sword retrieved uh, from the Thames also. Uh, it dates back to the 8th century and it looks really odd uh, and um, the only at first glance the only thing that seems clear about this description is that uh, we have a runic um, uh, a runic abc there but um, at the same time uh, it is flanked by two by two e letters as you can see um, in fact, we do seem to have a name here, which is Scrambled. This is the name Setbert, and uh, the text is um, analytically the same as the one uh, on the other objects from, from the Thames uh, River on the blade, but much more cunningly coded. So this was also something you could have done. Uh, perhaps it also had a meaning if you scrambled the words. Perhaps it meant that you uh, endowed it with even more magical power. But that is only speculative. Maybe, yeah, maybe the carver just did it for fun and uh, uh, we're over interpreting it uh, now. All right. The most common and varied of all runic and Similar texts, uh, however, here on the object known, objects known as bracteates. So bracteates, there are these um, golden medallion-like uh, pendants. Um, they're very thin and they look like a coin and you could have worn it like a, like a pendant. And you can also find them in, in, a lot of, um, in a lot of graves and also in a lot of depositions. Sometimes they are intentionally destroyed, probably with a ritualistic uh, connotation. Uh, you could have also worn them hung from the uh, belt, so not necessarily around uh, around your neck. And they were extremely popular during the migration period. Most of them date back to um, the period between 300 and 600. And examples have been found in Central Europe, in Scandinavia, in um, uh, England and in the Low uh, Countries. The runic texts were employed as replacements for legends typically found on large Roman coins. And we must also mention here that the uh, images depicted don't necessarily have anything to do with the uh, with the inscription. Um, sometimes the pictures would suggest mythological scenes. Um, we have examples of pendants um, where we have a man, for example, being uh, bitten by a wolf, just like the mythological Tyr lost his hand uh, while trying to uh, tame the wolf Fenrir in Old Norse mythology. But then again, um, it's very it's very difficult to draw this connection because we are dealing with very different uh, time periods. Of course, some of these mythological motifs would have survived also later on in the Viking Age, but it is also um, very, very difficult to extrapolate something that you can find in a literary source in the 1200s to, uh, to an image you find in the migration uh, period. There would have definitely been some, some common elements that have survived, but uh, other than that, we also need to take into account that this mythology would have probably been much more varied than the um, uh, literary texts um, allow us to, uh, to know. Many of the pendant legends are five-part amulet uh, texts, speaking of the uh, five categories uh, described um, uh, before. Some are otherwise, um, yeah, some are not really that uh, intelligible. Uh, on many of them, you can, again, find all kinds of letters which apparently don't really mean anything, but uh, the sequence of letters 
for example, they tend to use or overuse the letters A, L, N, uh, and U uh, in order to suggest this uh, magical potency. Or you can also have um, common words used on all kinds of inscriptions, perhaps uh, also in relation to fertility and power, such as the word uh, lauk, which means leak. Offerings. Yeah, when you think of bracteates, you can generally think of offerings such as um, uh, suggested, like it is, um, as it is suggested here in the Vardstena uh, bracteate. So this is uh, one of the one of the famous ones. It was discovered in Sweden in the late uh, 18th century. And um, um, it uh, probably has to do something with, um, uh, with offering because the first word means exactly, uh, exactly this. And then you again had have a sequence of the Futhark uh, row separated in its uh, traditional three uh, families and uh, uh, two repeated uh, charm words, which supposedly come from the Germanic verb Taoyan, which means to, to offer or to make. And this is uh, used in dedicatory inscriptions. Uh, so the etymology would seem to, uh, to fit here. Much as with the Vadstiana pendant, many runic amulets have charm words on them that appear to be um, somehow ritualistic in, um, in origin and um, they seem to be uh, simplified as well. So, for example, in these three examples um, I have here, um, you just you have a name first and then you have one of these words which uh, seem to be very common at the time. So, Ladu um, seems to be an invocation uh, as uh, as well. So, Lazo, Alu, and um, uh, Lauk, very common uh, words to be found on these inscriptions. Uh, here I offered some from uh, from Denmark, again from Tahum and Skonagar. Yeah, so uh, in this inscription, for example, from southern uh, Sweden, from Skone, you can find uh, you, you, you know, uh, not only find Alu on it, uh, you find uh, four words meaning uh, yeah, yeah, essentially the same thing, an invocation of some kind. Um, very interestingly, the third lakas, which means uh, uh, kill, uh, and uh, it's an imitative word, and uh, it is also connected with a word for the cuckoo, uh, derived from the, the noise that the bird uh, makes. And in this particular context, I would say that it possibly refers to some kind of of battle cry perhaps so in uh, in this sense of a battle roar if you will and uh, the other three words um yeah it's a pro they probably have to do with um, uh, fertility and some kind of uh, dedication uh, making the amulet a powerful warrior uh, charm uh, or the Ulst pendant, pendant uh, again in uh, in Denmark, hail dedication. Uh, the pendant also has uh, two swastikas on it, so the solar system. Uh, but it's not really clear uh, if either was supposed to complement the runic legend. The term Hagala is very interesting because it, it was also used in uh, uh, in uh, the Kragerhol spear shaft, as we've seen before, in order to invoke hail uh, in the spear. So it would seem logical for us to uh, assume that this would have been used in some kind of metaphorical sense because hail is a very powerful met meteorological phen phenomenon and um, uh, it would have been an attempt again to signify uh, power. Yeah, another interesting uh, example, an assortment of charm words with um, suggestive military uh, aspects was found at um, um, Antley in Suffolk, and uh, it has parallels to the other texts um, I presented to you. And uh, it reads, um, yeah, something like raw and strong and uh, reward. So this does seem to have a militaristic uh, connotation. It seems to indicate that this amulet somehow was referring to the military sphere, um, uh, supposedly to make the wearer a very strong and successful uh, warrior. And um, we also have uh, other examples um, that range from just writing uh, a word 
on uh, on them to uh, adding some interpretable uninterpretable letter sequences and all kinds of uh, all kinds of names and sometimes very perplexing sequences but the clear favorite charm words so to speak are alolazo and lauka so dedication invocation and let's say fertility symbolized by uh, the leek yeah these ones here are very very bizarre looking and perplexing um but um they also seem to uh encompass the word erilas um we talked about uh, before known from other scandinavian uh runic texts it also has some decorative or decorated uh, runes there and um, um again the swastikas um and um, um it's uh, usually regarded as so, as an example of um, of coding presumably understood as indicating an amuletic naming uh, expression so erilas and the other sequences um seem to be some kind of um um yeah coded rows with no particular uh, particular meaning if we go through the corpus we are going to definitely find more examples we have an example from the island of funen with a man's name and two uh, charm words as well as a letter sequence which uh, appears to be yeah more or less pronounceable um and um it may have something to do with the idea of magical utterance so these sequences don't necessarily mean have to mean something you can also um use them in a more playful manner in a more uh, twisted manner because probably this would have also given them uh, given them power and uh this um yeah could have also been a method of encryption uh used on the Lindholm uh, amulet sequence uh the coded sequence if read backwards it almost spells a word here the word um uh, tumnas which would mean something turned so uh perhaps the bone amulet being turned um would have also been referred to in the runic uh in runic inscription suggesting the shape of the uh, the object in the sense being in harmony with the uh with the object um we have some interesting cylinders also golden cylinders found near Faxe in uh Denmark again and um this would be uh what is written on them this word Foslau uh it's not really that obvious but the two the first two letters of this text are the first and uh last letters of the Futhark um row so similar to the um, alpha and uh, omega in um uh, in Greek and similar letter pairings were also employed in ancient times times to um to uh, signify mystical concepts such as the signs of the zodiac and so on and so uh, so forth although they could have also have their origin merely in uh, spelling lessons yeah with the passage of time these expressions tend to be more complex so if we look for example as at, at this uh, beautiful object from uh, the island of Sheeland in um, uh, Denmark again from the 5th or 6th century here we actually have a phrase um and it reads so hariuha haitika fara we saibu auya i am called hariuha i am wise about the danger and i give luck so this probably uh refers to the object uh, itself and the uh potential power the object can endow uh his um uh his master with yeah there are even more complex ones such as this one from the uh, Schirko amulet this was in uh, Sweden and it um uh, translates as wrought runes on foreign corn did i held for kunimund it's a bit weird here the appearance of uh, the inflected man's name um so for kunimund uh, along with what might be a description of another man's name um the warrior held 
and um, um, it seems to be a little aberrant in light of how names usually appear on these um, on these pendants. Um, it has been suggested that the text is uh, poetic um, and that the foreign corn actually refers to the uh, to the gold of the pendant, which was indeed a rare metal for the north uh, until um, Roman money diplomacy um, began. So, yeah, you could interpret it in uh, in that key. Uh, so, um, someone um, conceiving this inscription for uh, for someone else. Um, but then again, we also have the term runos here, uh, which um, yeah for the runes and this is um, um, in harmony with another pendant we can find in uh, Nimstedt uh, in Germany which um, bears an oddly formed legend that also seems to feature this um, this term. So Gliaug I consecrate runes and then again we have this term um, this term leak. So probably the term, or possibly the term runos um, would have been a replacement for an item description, such as a, uh, a pendant. However, other legends suggest that such an inscription would have been a poetic development of just a, a marker signature, a maker signature, sorry, uh, in the sense that I and then you say your name, made these runes, and um, then the um, um, third element of the Nebenstedt text would be just a reduction of such an, um, uh, an expression. So I suppose that the um, rune carvers would have toyed with um, such, um, uh, such more poetic formulae uh, themselves. Another interesting object was found in the Netherlands, um, in Bernsteboren, and it was uh, written on um, three undecorated section on sections of the body of a staff. And um, the inscription reads that from wood you turn to the... Um, and this, this, um, the way the inscription is formed reminds us of um, other inscriptions um, where the... Um, the body of the inscription is flanked by the man's uh, the man's name. Um, so this could be a variation of um, um, way to combine uh, the um, uh, native inscription with um, uh, with name the uh, five element uh, pattern. Um, a more difficult one is from Ödemotland uh, from uh, Norway. It's physically similar. It also has this crescent form um, and um, it um, bears quite a perplexing um, a sequence of um, runes and, uh, and symbols. And it definitely would have meant something to the carver, I assume. But for us, it's um, only relevant uh, that we can identify Buginu, which seems to be uh, a name. And um, then again, we also always need to take into account that perhaps these carvers had codes of their own, uh, some kind of uh, meanings that they developed themselves, and they would have been intelligible to a smaller community of people or only to themselves. So um, yeah, there is no way of knowing for sure what these would have, uh, would have meant. So to conclude the part on uh, the enabling uh, runic inscriptions, uh, the basic function of these inscriptions would have been blessing or, uh, or consecration, I would say. And uh, the relationships um, uh, between different uh, communities and people seems to be very relevant here as well, uh, because such types of formulae seem to have, have, have had the origins in the, the regions where the runes have their origins uh, themselves. So in, in the north and especially in the northeast of, of Italy, it is a region where we have a lot of uh, Etruscan inscriptions and uh, some of these inscriptions even carry the name of, um, of Alu. And even more interestingly, uh, it was a region where we have uh, archaeologically attested the worship of a form of the goddess uh, Artemis, Artemis Ortia. Um, and um, she, she would have been a, a, quite the patron of the words, if you, uh, if you want to put it like that. So uh, Artemis 
the one with the words, uh, if you want to translate it like that. Um, and uh, we have inscribed uh, votive um, inscriptions having been found here uh, in um, uh, in this region. So if she was indeed uh, worshipped as the goddess of writing in this region, it would definitely make even more sense that the origin of the runes are uh, um, is to be found here as well, as well as inspiration for this type of um, charms and uh, spells in the uh, in the Germanic um, world. I'm a little pressed with time here, so I'm going to use the last uh, 15 minutes to show you a couple of healing spells this time. Um, I've chosen to focus a lot on the, the enabling spells uh, in this presentation. So uh, now I'm going to show you some some of the healing spells and uh, perhaps in a future presentation, I can also show you some inscriptions having to do with the um, uh, fertility and um, um, other functions. So again, um, we have this Ribecranium we talked about uh, before, uh, invoking a triad of gods to help against um, a stroke provoked by some kind of um, some kind of uh, dwarf. And um, most examples of such finds are uh, Scandinavian, although we do have uh, evidence in Old English um, uh, as well. And they have to do with this medieval art of healing. Um, for which we also have the term leech um, uh, craft. So it was a common assumption in the Middle Ages that sickness was due to the intervention of evil spirits and that the evil spirits were thought to have entered your body um, through a particular orifice or through uh, by means of a dart of poison or something of the sort. And um, we have from the um, Old English uh, uh, speaking world, uh, we do have some um yeah, some um, you know, some books with a lot of um, uh, similar uh, charms and rituals like the ones in the Scandinavian world, in Lakhmanga, for example, and um, uh, they're also inspired from uh, Greek or Roman medical law as well as from the English um, uh, Irish Christianity. So a lot of cultural contacts here and um, um, Scandinavian charms also represented a synthesis of classical, ancestral, and uh, pagan uh, pagan law. Yeah, let's look at a couple of uh, examples besides the one in uh, uh, in Viba. Uh, we have one from uh, Sigtuna in uh, Sweden. Uh, it was perforated, so it could have been worn somehow attached to some part of the uh, body and it addresses the sickness demon as the wolf, a term applied to uh, people outside of society, generally speaking, at it, it also seems to have some kind of a pagan connotation because uh, wolves were pretty common in, um, in uh, Norse mythology as well. So it uh, essentially states um, ogre of the wound fever, lord of the ogres, flee now because you are found. Have for yourself three pangs, wolf. Have yourself nine needs. Wolf and these ice runes may grant that you be satisfied, you wolf. Make good use of the healing charm. So in this amulet, the spirit responsible for this um, is uh, cursed with uh, three pangs and nine needs, uh, a tribulation of some kind. It's also a pretty common formula in this kind of uh, um, in this kind of um, charms. And um, you're going to find healing sticks as well uh, against uh, all kinds of creatures, elves and trolls and um, uh, ogres, uh, thursir. And uh, in um, um, Old English poetry in Beowulf, for example, uh, Grendel is also described as a uh, Thirs. Um, so this would seem to imply an evil monster in general. Um, in Scandinavian folklore, at least in, in Old Norse mythology, um, the um, uh, categories, so the differences between these uh, types of monsters were not really that uh, that obvious, but any at any rate, the um, um, Disease is described as some kind of monster and um, uh, the inscription charges uh, the disease, this monster uh, tormenting the sick person to uh, to leave. And uh, we also find parallels in uh, spells in um, uh, a Canterbury manuscript, for example, where we have a mention of somebody called Giril, the wound uh, causer. Uh, and uh, this was against uh, blood vessel uh, pus. 
the expression uh, I see three ogres and nine needs uh, can also be compared to other inscriptions. For example, we do have a, a curse stick from Bergen uh, with a similar invocation. Uh, and we also have a reference in the Eddic poem for Skirnis, where, uh, yeah, essentially the servant of the god Freud threatens um, the giantess uh, the god um, is uh, courting with some kind of, uh, of curse. Like he says he's going to carve for her um, three staves of evil and a thurs, an ogre, or something like that. Yeah, and uh, we also have a reference in um, the uh, second uh, Sigtuna um, amulet, uh, as well as on some uh, on some other uh, on some other sticks, and um, the expression can be found in the sense of wolfish evil as well or hatefulness this is something you're going to find on uh, uh, on the um, uh, stick from um, uh, from bergen for example and um, uh, other sticks yeah you can also find in lötose in um, uh, in sweden so um, this um, suggests that uh, it would have been quite the common belief in um, to carve such runes in order to uh, cast away some uh, some kind of demon it's a um, pretty uh, pretty clear quite clear what we can find on the second sectuna amulet uh, which reads rise and go away beneath the benevolent stars and make this uh, confused mist and uh, destroy this sunshine a bit unclear here i see three ogres and nine needs i conjure the overseer of the uh, of the sanctuary so um such invocations would have been quite uh, quite common. Ideographic ones as well on this stick uh, below in Lut uh, you can actually find the name um, Naud, Need, and Thurs if you um, if you look for the letters in this um, uh, in this longer inscription because um, the um, um, uh, cut inside the C, the S runes, are actually um, monograms of N and O. And this would suggest that the um, inscription consists of a very complicated um, um, series, sequence of words designating uh, these monsters as well as the needs that um, uh, need to go away kind of pagan exorcism is also retrieved from Riba uh, in the 1300s. Um, again, with some Christian interpolations, th this is also something you're going to find very often, a mix up of uh, Christian and um, uh, pagan uh, beliefs and uh, formulae. And um, uh, this is also kind of uh, cryptic um, because it begins with an invocation to uh, the earth and to the high heavens, the sun and holy Mary and the Lord God himself, that he grant me leech hands. So he wants to be a powerful medicine man, with other, in other words, and a healing tongue. So he also perhaps wants to be able to enchant or to say a prayer or both to um, heal the trembler when a cure is needed. And then it goes on with mentioning the parts of the body from back and from breast, from body and from limb, from eyes and from ears, from wherever evil can enter. A stone is called uh, Svart by the name of Svart. It stands out in the sea. There lie upon it nine needs who should neither sleep sweet nor wake warm until you pray this cure, which I have proclaimed in runic words amen so you can see here we have we really have a mix up of uh, different uh, Norse concepts um, this idea of high heaven is not necessarily a Christian one in itself because this uh, also occurs not only in anglo-saxon uh, text with the a pagan context but it also occurs in a poem such as the um, such as the Voluspo where it is mentioned that earth shall be riven and uh, high heaven uh, presumably evoking the final uh, battle of Ragnarok. Um, 
but um, yeah, it it's a runic charm that makes reference to um, further ancient tropes, yeah, like the healing with hands and then healing with words uh, or healing with the tongue, metaphorically speaking, and um, then um, all these um, all these elements uh, seem to represent pre-Christian rhetorical uh, traditions. So, in the sense that um, you you are um, essentially uh, mentioning all the body part, parts that need um, that uh, need re redemption or healing, and um, this you can also relate to Anglo-Saxon charms, for example, against uh, uh, against elves uh, and also against worms that you can find in the German speaking space. And um, this charm, for example, um, is pretty similar in the sense that it says something like go out worm with uh, nine little ones out from the marrow of the bone, from bone to flesh, from flesh to skin, from skin to the uh, arrow. So the way I see it, um, like you also have this kind of magical stone and the stone is supposedly um, meant to capture all the pain and all the torment and then you cast the stone somewhere far away um, so um, it, it's going to uh, the pain is going to leave you and it is going to be uh, somewhere it uh, uh, it cannot affect you anymore uh, yeah these are protective prayers known as the um, Lodeke, uh, naming various parts of the uh, of the body. Uh, they're not only known from pagan contexts, they're also known from Christian liturgical manuscripts, and um, they have been charms to, uh, they have been um, uh, claimed originally to have been charms to counter classical binding, uh, binding curses and they continue to be very popular in Germanic um, leech um, uh, craft. You can also find them in later sources such as the Book of Magic uh, from Iceland on Galdra book and later Scandinavian uh, inscriptions. Um, and um, we can also recall here the idea of the uh, uh, nine needs uh, in the sense of Odin's connection with nine twigs in the nine herbs uh, charm for snake bite from the uh, Laknunga where a similar allusion is made to a herb um, <clears throat> which grew on uh, on stone. So um, yeah, pretty interesting here to see how all these elements um, uh, combine. And I have a couple of examples more. Um, yeah, so this belief in malignant uh, spirits of disease was um, um, quite common at the time uh, and to protect themselves, Scandinavians would carve runic charms to ward off these uh, beings. Uh, and um, you can find uh, two further examples, for example, here in um, um, <clears throat> In a Norwegian text from the 13th century, um, you also find an example with a stone that is heated. Imi heated the stone and never shall the smoke uh, smoke and never shall the cooking be cooked. Out heat, Imi heated the, um, the stone. So this appears to be uh, a curse um, as, as well. And uh, then we also have the uh, amulet from Höxtena in, um, uh, in Sweden, which was also thought to ward off some uh, insidious uh, beings. This is a very interesting uh, amulet because it was first believed to have been um, composed to ward off a, a revenant or to, to prevent um, somebody uh, dead from coming uh, uh, from rising from the dead um, and um, there has been um, a new interpretation so the older interpretation would have been I incant against the spirit against the sitting one against the signing one against the traveling one against the flying the flying one, I shall completely wither and um, uh, and die. So since the amulet was found in a grave, it has been suggested initially that this was a revenant spirit. Um, but um, then again, there is another interpretation. So besides the idea of, you know, if, if you go in the grave, you should stay in the grave. Um, and um, um, the idea that uh, the community should be protected in front of uh, such revenants. But the new interpretation um, would uh, tend to indicate a rite of some sort uh, through the enchanting one, through the one destined for the gallows, through the uh, killing ones, through the offering ones, through the ones performing magic, through the flying ones, through the traveling ones. So perhaps the meaning here would uh, be that of a funeral uh, feast, so uh, giving nourishment also with the help of, uh, of the dead. So you can see how complicated it is uh, sometimes to interpret such um, 
and uh, they continue further on in the uh, Middle Ages. Um, so you're going to find all kinds of um, mixtures between um, runes, like medieval runes, and then you have a, a Latin text actually hidden there um, with um, yeah, what seems to be like a prayer, uh, a prayer of some kind. And um, such, a, such texts are yeah, are found in um, uh, different uh, manuscripts, uh, including the Galtra book. And uh, this would have been, for example, uh, or is thought to have been a formula against um, uh, against malaria um, or some sort of uh, of other uh, diseases. And um, uh, exorcisms were common at uh, uh, at the time, so writing them in runes perhaps would have given them even more uh, even more power. We also have some rhyming formulae from uh, the same period, from the medieval period, um, something like the uh, abracadabra, which again is something you are going to find uh, even written in runes. And um, there is also this interesting habit of writing it. Um, so first you write the longer word and then it becomes shorter and then it becomes even shorter and so on and so forth. And um, the assumption is that um, by uh, by doing that, you actually cause the, uh, the disease or whatever torment it is uh, to uh, disappear so uh, gradually uh, disappear and again you also have a couple of uh, of other um, rhyming formulae as well such as Anna Christiana Visti and uh, even Hocus Pocus um, you can uh, find so um, yeah actually very very serious formulae which have then been uh, adapted to um, rhyme in um, uh, in such uh, uh, exorcism magical uh, in magical formulations so this the significance of of this one here god in cordar in cordar um this seems to have something to do with um, um a term used for uh, for binding although i'm not really that uh, that sure about that um however um yeah, generally speaking, such expressions are corruptions of um, uh, well-known Latin liturgical um, liturgical uh, phrases. And I am going to end the presentation with something that is a little more pagan than uh, the ones I discussed uh, uh, previously, which seem to be a little more uh, Christian. So the codified sequences, like the rhyming uh, thistle, mistletoe formula, which occurs in various forms throughout uh, Sweden, Denmark, Norway and um, Iceland, and it occurs in this cryptic sequence. Uh, you can also find it on two runestones from the Viking Age. So the Letberg runestone and the Gerlev um, runestone. And um, here you can find this um, uh, magical formula. So thistle, mistletoe and casket. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cryptic, um, especially on the Letberg stone from Sweden, because here we also have depicted some some scenes which apparently are from the uh, from the Ragnarok uh, apocalypse. And um, then we have this very standard memorial text with um, um, someone called BC who placed a stone in memory of his father Thorgaut. And then we have this cryptic runic um, uh, sequence. And um, the um, a version of the same formula is actually found in um, the saga of Bossi and, uh, and Herauth, which is a later saga, a legendary saga, but it's also very interesting to see that um, not everything in the legendary sagas um, uh, seems to be fantastic. They um, also have some kind of uh, historical uh, core there, and um, the purpose of the original charm is not really known, but I suspect it has to do with some kind of herb law because mistletoe was um, very well known in the um, central European space. It had a deep meaning in, in Celtic tradition and in Old Norse mythology. You can also um, find it in, this, in um, uh, the arrow, for example, that was uh, made to kill the god uh, Balder and mistletoe was also the plant, the only plant who um, didn't want to swear not to harm Balder and it ends up, um, well, at least indirectly uh, killing this um, uh, bright uh, god of Norse, uh, uh, of Norse mythology. So yeah, this is also something you should watch out for.
also more complex rune sticks such as this one from Turnsberg from the 13th century where we have um, a variation of protective formulas and um, um, the uh, conclusion um, can be compared with the greeting on the Bergen stone um, story stick I mentioned before with the Odin and Thor hail to you and be in good uh, in good spirits so here you have uh, a lot of elements a lot of things are going on in this uh, inscription from the 13th century um, so first of all uh, we have a guy called Elif the worthy um, who owns this um, uh, stick and then he says we have spoken much between ourselves with the reason that I want to learn runes from it and I ask you will you give me one of these to marry and then these are mistletoe plowshare probably to still his still casket and then a sequence of um of numbers as a matter of fact and then a little bit of gossip because two characters are mentioned who uh, are both lodging together and then the end formula hail to you hail and good fortune to you um to you then so um a little probably a case of runic cryptography here which was kind of widespread in uh, in medieval uh, bergen for example but also in um, uh, in uh, other places um, so this stick starts with a casual statement of ownership uh, then uh, apparently a proposal of marriage um, and then some cryptic um, runes and then the expanded mistletoe casket formula and then a system denoting the numbers from 1 to 20 um, and then and then the uh, uh, the ending with um, uh, hailing the um, uh, the um, uh, gods so you do have ciphers occurring in runic inscriptions from the earliest to the uh, latest uh, time periods in all kinds of forms yeah, so the uh, preliminary conclusion for today would be that we have a traditional Germanic um, magic mixed with all kinds of Christian rites and prayers, as well as influence from the Greco-Roman uh, tradition. So I would generally define this um, um, system of formulae that are found in runic um, inscriptions uh, denoting magic as being a syncretic one and as we have seen uh, they can have a lot of forms um, starting with just one name or one word and uh, moving on so until the middle ages we have a lot of diversity um, and uh, yeah, going into the direction of uh, exorcising um, amulets so um, the the Christians uh, also have adopted a part of this um, uh, pagan world and the pagan world um, has also been influenced by um, by Christianity so all in all uh, with regard to the initial question uh, of whether we can regard uh, runes as magical or not I would say um, yes and no I would say that rather writing in itself should be considered as an act of magic and not runes uh, themselves so inherently i don't think they possessed so from from the contextual evidence from the historical evidence evolutionary and so on they don't seem to have inherent powers uh, themselves but the way you use them in different charms with different functions um, tend to go into this direction that they were considered somehow uh, powerful uh, in the sense of a means of communication that could also be have been used in this um, uh, in this concept uh, context um, because at least at the beginning um, there were uh, definitely only a couple of people who would have been uh, able to perform this act of writing which would have made it powerful in itself and then of course you could have also written a lot of charms and um, spells and um, um, yeah whatever kind of um, uh, of messages uh, with them and um, use uh, your own system of encoding member uh, or um, uh, ciphers also the rock uh, rune stone i mentioned before also uses cipher runes and uh, you know toy with all kinds of uh, letters in order to uh, express yourself and in order to invoke the gods or in order to empower a certain type of object well i hope this was interesting for you and uh, you could find out uh, a couple of uh, things about um, the typologies of runic charms 
And uh, yeah, I'm hoping to continue at some point uh, with uh, introducing to you uh, other functions in runic magic.